And good morning or good afternoon, everyone. So the interview we are hosting today discusses an unknown and under-researched page of the history of colonial and post-colonial Libya, but also the history of colonialist and post-colonialist Italy. But today's interview also discusses ways in which colonial histories should or could be told, method-wise. And I don't want to anticipate uh, anything more. Uh, because the guest we have today will explain and clarify all the points we need to clarify. So today we have the pleasure to listen to Ali Abdullatif Amida. Ali Amida is a professor and founding chair of the Department of Political Science, College of Arts and Sciences at the University of New England in the US. His scholarship focuses on power, agency, and anti-colonial resistance in North Africa, especially Northern Libya. And for me, it's a personal and professional pleasure to have him here because his scholarship has been extremely relevant for me to critically engage with and fill the gap of Italian colonial and post-colonial sources. He's the author of The Making of Modern Libya, State Formation, Colonization and Resistance, 1830, 1932, for SUNY Press, 1994, of Forgotten Voices, Power and Agency in Colonial and Post-Colonial Libya, edited by Rutledge, uh, published by Rutledge in 2005. And very recently this year, he published a fundamental book in colonial history, African history and Italian history, but also in genocide and Holocaust studies. So the book we are going to discuss today is titled Genocide in Libya, Shar, A Hidden Colonial History. I just want to share the uh the book cover uh here it is you should see my screen now okay yeah that's the book we're going to discuss today and the last introductory remark uh before starting with the interview is that this interview is part of a workshop i have co-organized with uh colleagues at the ui so one shun from the law department lilian and matteo from the Center for Advanced Studies and Maria and Maria from the History and Civilization Department. And I want also to thank P and Joshwani for their logistic support. So the workshop is titled Envisioning the Global South and, is, and we conceived it as a space for us to discuss the challenges and the limits of uh, our Eurocentric approaches and also to learn how to be inclusive and less biased uh, by discussing empirical research. So, uh, so the interview today introduces the content of the book. So what happened in Libya between 1929 and 1934 under fascist Italian rule, uh, then reflects on methods and concepts that go beyond this research case. And I would also uh, like to hear from, uh, yeah, about the potential of this book in terms of scholar and public debate, what this book expected so um, then uh, I will really like to have space for questions at the end of this session. But of course, if you, have, if you have a question that is directly related to what we are discussing, please write it down in the chat and I'll try to include it in our conversation. So if you don't have uh, any question and if you agree, Ali, we can start with the first question. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I can. Okay, so I selected two extracts from your book. And okay, so yes, I selected two, these two extracts from your book. And I did that to give voice to the survivors and to describe what happened before and during the internment. So we have uh, an, uh, an extract of an interview you conducted with Aya Bahia Albaidim. Al so an intern in Braiga camp, one of the 16 camps that were established and run by uh, the Italians. So he said about his experience in the camp, the Italian army took our food and animals and did not give us any. We were forced to walk from our homes in the Green Mountains to Sirte, the longest distance from northeastern Barca to the camp. Anyone who slowed down was whipped or shot. And the dead ones were left in the road 
without being proper Muslim burial. In addition, when they forced us to board the ship, some people died and they were thrown into the sea. The second extract is, um, are a few lines from a long poem called Mabib Marat by Rajab Buawish al Minifi, and is one of the most important poems and uh, that preserve the story we are going to uh, introduce. Th those are just a few lines, and I selected those lines because they exemplify different, um, I mean, different um, experiences within the camp. The title is I Have No Illness Except. Uh, what they experience in the camp. So I have no illness except the hearing of abuse, denial of pleas, and the loss of those who were once eminent. And women lay down naked, striped for the least of causes, trampled and ravished, acts that no words deign describe. I have no illness except upon the saying of beat them, no pardon and with the sword extract their labor. Those are just two of the many testimonies you collected. So the first question is, uh, can you tell us what you discovered about the camps? And can you explain how life was in the 16 internment camps that the Italian established in coastal and desert Libya? What did Libyan experience? and how we can recover this information. So if you can just introduce briefly your sources since I gave two extracts from them. Thank you. Um, once again, uh, good uh, afternoon to everybody. And thank you, Roberta and Matteo for this wonderful invitation to be with you. <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the sources that you cited and read for us it came as uh, a result of, of original research design that went um, nowhere. I, I started my research in the year 2000, and I thought that I'll go to the archives either in Italy or in Tripoli or in Tunis or in Cairo or in, in also the UK and the United States. And I reach dead ends. Time, sometimes there is really no co collaboration to get me into the material as in the Italian archives earlier. Uh, other times the material, the most serious materials on the camps was missing. So, I began to re rethink my, my research and a few senior colleagues, including Italian ones like Professor Angelo Del Bocca, uh, whom I corresponded with and uh, Giorgio Rochat, the two eminent, uh, very, very distinguished uh, Italian historians who really uh, told me, don't waste your time here if you want to find profound original material, uh, see if you go to Eastern Libya and, and meet the survivors before they die. So at the beginning of, of, of the millennium, I began to re rethink my methodology and rethink my research. And I began to, um, to go to Eastern Libya to find out where are the survivors and whether they're, um, you know, uh, where I could find them. Now, I was unlucky, unlucky. The fact I was born in Libya and my family had uh, close contacts with Eastern Libya and my mother, uh, my grandmother's from Eastern Libya held me. The Center of Libyan Studies in Tripoli, which is one of the most remarkable, you know, uh, centers in the whole region. And they collected oral history under the, um, the supervision of Professor Jean Vancina, the late Jean Vancina, the leading um, scholar and the father of modern African history, oral history, I should say. So I got some material. The, the folks in Tripoli gave me all the recorded oral history on the camps and some of the, arch of the, um, of the archives, Italian and Arabic 
um, pr primarily. But my, my focus has been how I could find the survivors, Roberta. So I went to Eastern Libya and through my friends and my um, uh, colleagues at the University of Benghazi and, and people who are uh, in, in Benghazi and other towns and cities in Eastern Libya, they began to introduce me to some of the survivors. At the beginning, they were reluctant to talk to me. And I, I have a whole chapter, chapter number one, I say, I reflect about how as a scholar, I put myself in a, in a same situation and they interviewed me before I interviewed them. And slowly they interviewed me, who, who you are, what are you gonna do with this material? Are you linked to the state? What are you gonna do with in outside Libya? And that kind of uh, difficulty at the, at the beginning led to a breakthrough when they began to trust me and they began to really uh, open to me, they introduced me to other survivors. And here, this, you know, by survivors, I'm referring, uh, Roberta, to uh, uh, kids who were interned in the concentration camps at the age, between the age of five and 15. Survivors of, of that horrific experience. And, and I began to, every summer, I'll go to Eastern Libya and spend three, uh, three weeks, sometimes four weeks, for almost a decade. And then I discovered the, the two sources that you cited, and you are very perceptive to focus on, on the two sources. First is the oral testimonies and the oral um, history, and for men and women that time. And they began to tell me, including this, this uh, remarkable lady who uh, began to tell me about how they were interned, how they were rounded up, how they were moved to the camps. And that story was very vivid and very detailed, even though it happened you know, um, almost 60, 70, 80, 80 years ago to, to, uh, uh, when I was um, researching that time. But also I discovered another source, which you cited as well. The, I realized that my education, public education in independent Libya and in Egypt and the United States did not prepare me to understand something really hidden. Uh, and I said, my grandmother and my mother, you know, reflect that culture, subculture within the culture, which is in interior Libya, in Southern Libya and Eastern Libya, the culture of communication is not only oral, but poetic. People express themselves through poetry. Uh, in Arabic. And you're talking here about a culture within a culture. You need to understand the vocabulary. You need to understand the meter. You need to understand the metaphors. And you need to understand and realize how this uh, um, folks who are either nomads or semi-nomads or going back and forth between agriculture and, and um, uh, nomadism and pastoralism, really they have their own creative way of communicating and expressing themselves. So oral history and poetry is a very important one, uh, sources of understanding the culture and also understanding how they, they uh, reacted and recorded uh, their um, experience in this really forgotten genocide. So it took me a while, but at the same time, I realized I couldn't finish this research in um, say uh, three, uh, five years. I usually take, take me five, six years to finish a manuscript. This was more complex, more uh, um, um, really hidden and requires patience, verifications, and examinations. And, and I, des I decided that I'm not gonna hurry it. And one of my senior colleagues, uh, a historian, an Ottoman historian told me, uh, listen, Ali, it's gonna take you at least 
a decade. This is not an easy subject and you need to be patient with it. Now, I was naive and gullible. I waited 10 years <laughs> to finish it. And uh, mm -hmm. itself, the, doing the interviews, but also doing the field work. My field work and oral history interviews became a methodological and also a conversation that lasted for a decade to figure out and verify what happened between 1929 and 1934 and after the, what I called a genocide. Yeah, I really like the idea of uh, the image of history as a puzzle where everything should find the right place. Otherwise you can not solve this puzzle. And okay. you, yeah, you used a lot like other disciplines Theories coming from, even if from history, you used a lot of uh, different concepts and that was very interesting from a, from a methodological point of view. And also something that struck me when I read the, the, when I was reading the book is that you did not only mention like archival sources, but you specified those are all our oral sources. Yes. And very, I, like yes, striking yes. for me coming from a very like, a training that sources are written. Of course, we have we have oral history, but the first thing you do as a historian, you go to an archive and you try to find written documents. So yeah. Those yeah. So Roberta, can, can I add one one quick sure. note here? The study of oral history has been flourishing for the last forty years, but some there is a prejudice among some um, some scholars who study oral history by dismissing it, oh, the, uh, the oral history of, of the, uh, uh, the folks in the camps or the one who went through the, they, their history is really messy, it's a very different dialect, or we, it's not reliable, uh, all of these excuses, which is a way of escaping the moral and the um, historical uh, facts of taking the other as equal and uh, mm -hmm. taking the other as a, a full-fledged living culture and living society. So for me, it was, um, now I couldn't do that just doing a critical political science as you, you are absolutely correct. My training and my background is, is multidisciplinary. I studied as a historical sociology and anthropology, political science and African history. And I had to, I couldn't finish this, this, this book without really becoming uh, doing research in, in, in many continents, across cultures, across languages, and yes, cross disciplines. And that made me at the end very disillusioned with the area studies and the idea of disciplinary research at the end. Yeah, and then there is a strong connection uh, between the Holocaust studies and oral history. So all the Holocaust uh, yes, 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 yes. It came yes. through the testimonies of survival. Otherwise, yes. we could not even reconstruct the German Holocaust or the Jewish Holocaust. So, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that yes. was very, uh, it, it's a useful remark. So, different sources drives us to different conclusions and different stories. Yes. Um, I will move to the second question because the story we are telling, it's a story of violence. And uh, can you see my screen? I'm sharing the screen. I don't know if you can see the illustration. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, I was I, I was always uh, amazed by how violence and was used until a certain time of the uh, colonial history in Italy, and then violence disappeared quickly. Like and this happened uh, uh, in the early 1930s. So the use of violence to break anti-colonial resistance is a common element to all colonial rules. But for the time period that the Italian violence occurred, I mean, in the interwar period, I mean, fascist violence uh, was really out of context, was reached a level of brutality that was not conceivable even at the time. So the illustration here is a satirical illustration uh, that is, that was, I took from uh, an Italian newspaper called L'Azione Coloniale, the Colonial Action, and is uh, from June 
31. So the satirical illustration to me tells two main things. So the first one is that the international reaction to the brutality of the Italian army was very strong at the time. But at the same time, it shows that fascism showcased violence as something to be proud of. But so this, uh, I connected this with something that, with an episode that you reconstruct uh, at the beginning of your, uh, uh, of your book in chapter one. Yes. So you, I, I'm quoting uh, you. So on September 11, 1931, the Italian army brought the captured Umar al-Mukhtar, the leader of the anti-colonial resistance to the concentration camp of Slop and forced over 20,000 interned people, including the old, children, men, and women, to attend the hanging of their old beloved leader. After this public hanging spectacle, the soldiers took the corpse and buried him in a secret grave. So I reflected about the spectacularization of violence uh, made by the fascist regime. But the story here that you're telling is a story of hidden violence. Yes. So fascist sources, Italian officials, Italian institutions covered everything up. But can you explain how the process of the removal of the main element of violence happened in colonial and post-colonial periods in Italy? And the removal is a key category to explain the elaboration of the colonial past in Italian uh, historiography, but also in the Italian public debate. We removed a lot. We removed everything that was connected to violence. And why Eurocentric historiography managed to disentangle Italian colonialism from violence? I think this is a crucial point that you made. But at the same time, violence is very present in fascist sources, in fascist propaganda, until the 1930, 1935. After that, the main narrative became another one. So if you can just tell something about violence, the use of violence. Well, the, uh, in, in the colony of Libya, violence um, was part of, um, of, of, of course, the whole uh, history. And the concentration camps is really not the only um, um, episode. It's the worst crime and the most brutal of all the, the crimes. There is uh, other uh, examples and faces, the, um, the colonialists and especially the fascists who refuse any, any uh, way of um, making a modus vivendi with the, with the uh, native population. And, and unfortunately, this, very, very um, brutal um, starvation and internment of a whole over, I, I, I calculated around 110,000 people. Um, after a while, it became really not very well known. Uh, there are few scholars in Italy knew about it. Uh, the Libyan people knew about it. The Arab world knew a little bit, but not much. But for some odd reasons, this case and the violence that you talk about, Roberta, has been hidden in books or hidden in, in archives and magazines, but also with a very much uh, arrogant and racist language that legitimized racism and violence and including a killing and hanging and genocide, as I try to explain. The, uh, I attribute the lot, the, this, this really the suppression and and also the, replace, the replacement of this uh, colonial violence and killing uh, the, by even the idea that uh, Angelo Del Bocca always remind us of, which is l'Italiani um, uh, brava gente. Um, this is a, we are not like the Germans. Um, and this is really um, maybe a harsh a little bit, but not genocidal nor violent. There are three explanations in my opinion uh, Roberta, for um, for this, uh, not only the double the double burden, you know, um, silencing colonial fascist history on one hand, and replacing it with this idea of a little bit uh, moderate, but not really harsh, nor genocidal, nor violent model, 
the, the three explanations I would argue are the following. The first one is the very entrenched idea of a U European Eurocentric view that you don't deal with the colonies. Violence in Europe is, is important, including the Holocaust, of course, uh, and the killing of Jews and gypsies and other groups. But dealing with African genocides, the Herero, the, uh, the, the, um, the Congo, Belgium, uh, and of course, the, the, the case that disappeared from um, most um, models and scholarship is the Libyan case. I think first is the Eurocentric idea that legitimized racism and, and, and violence and genocide. The second one is the idea anti-communism and the Cold War later on. Uh, and the, the very idea of, um, of Italian fascist regime being needed in the fight against Germany. And the fact that as many Italian scholars thought there was no Nuremberg-like uh, uh, trials, war uh, crimes uh, trials for that. And therefore you have uh, the idea of um, fascism is legitimized even after the post-war and you have political parties that still say we are reforming fascism. So that's a second one. The third one, this, I believe that the, um, for some odd reason, uh, also inside uh, independent Libya, the post-colonial uh, post state, independent, the monarchy and Gaddafi's regimes, they, the, the, the independent um, uh, elite that um, through the UN and the supervision of UK um, negotiated Libyan independence, they decided, they made a choice that Libyan history was violent and horrible and destructive. And it's not just an easy uh, colonization like other colonization. So decided to be silent about it. That was a choice. Um, maybe we could say that because they really wanted to, to um, the country wanted to recover and build itself, but it was at a price. The second Gaddafi, as you know, Roberta, um, and this is how we could understand whether we, you know, we, we agree with what happened in 1969 or not. He said, everybody ignored you and began to scream. I remember Eric Salerno, uh, my Italian um, colleague and friend, he told me uh, the reason I, I wrote this small book about what happened in Libya, the about the concentration camps, I was listening to Gaddafi and he kept shouting, remember that gala, remember that gala to the Libyans. And of course, Libyan, remember a gala. This is the Arsh the Arshowitz of, of, uh, of the Libyan um, uh, concentration camps. And people remember it, remember it very vividly. And his anger, and his um, uh, uh, um, fury uh, really could be understood. Uh, this is the argument I make because of that long silence about it. So what you have is Eurocentric scholarship, anti-communism and Cold War, and the lack of trials for the crimes of Italian fascism. Uh, with the exception, of course, I have to really uh, haste to say, Roberta, that there are some courageous Italian scholars, minority, who refuse to um, to um, be silent, like uh, Rochat, like Dilboca, um, I would say even um, 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 La Banca to a, to a point, uh, my, friend, my other friends who wrote about Alex Salerno and other people who wrote about it. But at the same time, the idea of what happened in Libya is part of colonial um, uh, way of thinking. And it's not as, it should be looked differently. As if Europe and area study, European studies would be one thing and culture and history and, and, and the, the Africa and the other parts of the, the colonies is completely different. And that legacy that has not been confronted until today, I'm, I'm sorry, Roberta, but I think I would say with all the goodwills of many people, Italy has not, really confronted the ghosts of the past. And I hope that my book, not to bone fingers, but open a new phase and break the silence about that really repressed uh, uh, colonial history and the invisibility 
of of the violence that occurred in 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 the few really brutal places, including Libya. Yeah, no, and I want to add that Angelo Del Boca, besides being an eminent scholar, he has been a partisan in the fight against uh, fascism in Italy. Yes, so yes, there yes. is a strong civil component when someone started to study uh, colonial Italian colonialism, and Angelo Del Boca was not a scholar at the time, he was a journalist. He yes. started doing this. Yeah. And it's true that the, his, the, the scholarship of, on Italian colonialism didn't start in academia, didn't start in Italian academia, it started outside and was, all, was every time fostered by the public debate. So in yeah. the 90s, we have a journalist debate and after the journalist debate, and um, Nicola Labanca started to uh, engage with this topic and he wrote his, still his major work on Italian colonialism. So yeah, it's a sensitive uh, topic and I think it's your book is really helpful because it is not doesn't uh, help uh, us to understand only the Italian system, but it doesn't present Libya as a monolith. So no, this, no, no, yeah. not at all, not at all. And I think I would add this is an excellent uh, follow up. I am critical of colonial, fascist, Eurocentric, uh, an area study scholarship and national scholarship. My book it doesn't is not easy on on, on that either. As I'm say, seeing in Italy when I visit Italy and I love Italy and I visited uh, you know and I still do research. I have many friends over the last thirty years. I see the symbol of fascism still and monuments have not been checked. I see political parties are part of the establishment and even became deputy minister and foreign minister in the um, 1994 and 2001 and two. I see a lot of unspoken and, and unchecked, um, uh, you know, um, um, rehabilitation of uh, new fascist movements. And I and, and I see the monuments in, in, in Rome and other places. I even, uh, was really um, um, uh, uh, taken by the fact that even Graziani, who is really the one who executed this genocide, is still being looked as as a, an, an honorable soldier or an officer. So I think in, you know it, Italian society and Italian academe need to confront and face history. That's the only way we could heal the past. That's the only way not inside Libya, but also inside Italy itself. And the future is really only then we could uh, recover and, and have a, a more and more um, uh, honest way to talk about it. As far as Libya, you're absolutely correct. I am very critical of the elitism and the appropriation of the genocide and the silence and the neglect that happened even sometimes under Gaddafi because when I described my field work, when I went to the camps, I focused on only in five camps because uh, the 16 uh, others, I thought that would be very hard. And most of the death uh, of this, and now I think between 60 to 70,000 not 40,000 as I discovered in my early research in 2005. And I think the, the, uh, the camps are neglected, the, uh, the evidence is, is decaying, and the survivors are many, very poor and are still suffering, many of them. And I think this is where I'm very hard on the modern post-colonial national state, and I see history um, and culture and genocide is not a matter of studying it in one country. That's why my book methodologically proposing a new way, which is not only to, to criticize the colonial fascist and Eurocentric methodologies and models, the, the nation state and the nationalist um, way of, of trying to appropriating it. And I called for transnational, transcultural um, a way of looking at uh, culture and history. It's not just about Libya. I tried in this book to uh, provoke a new way of rewriting Italian and European history. Yeah, and I mean, this is uh, what I'm trying to do with my research is trying to incorporate colonies into the history of Italy. Why we disentangled Italian history from colonialism. I mean, colonialism shaped Italy and shaped post-colonial Italy because colonialism is not only a fascist, like, 
phenomenon. It was there be before the fascism and it still is in play. As you said, I mean, our in our public space, we naturalize colonialism and the representation of the others. And But now I have to say that there are a lot of decolonizing movements, especially in public space, that are challenging yes. this. And this yes. is a very encouraging like uh, phenomenon that is happening in Italy, besides all the re recruitations of the fascist uh, poli political discourse, this is true. But yeah, but, but let me let me add one one small point, Roberta. Allow me. I am arguing it's no longer possible if we want to write the history, the interconnected history for good and bad. We cannot write the history of uh, Libya, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia without understanding the history of Italy. And it's no longer possible to study the history of Italy, Germany and Europe in general without understanding the history of Africa. Our histories are interconnected and no longer in the 21st century, we should just be confined or um, uh, repeat the canons and the models in our academic discourses and, and training to think that the nation state will be the only uh, normal way of studying it. That will be really confining and will be misleading. Yeah, no, no, and I was really like, uh, inspired when I read that, I mean, the story of the genocide, you described it as like squeezed and suppressed by these two mainstream narratives, the nationalist and the Italian representation of uh, Italian colonialism. So it was, I mean, it was also a remind for me to go to sources and start looking at uh, the history we want to tell without being biased from the narratives that have been constructed. So we have to start again from sources. And this, in, in this respect, your, I, I think that your book will help us to write better colonial histories in the future. I want to ask a last question, then I will open the floor and see uh, if others have other questions. Uh, and you mentioned, you touched upon this uh, element that is the element of language. Uh, the, yeah, you pay a lot of attention to language. And the language of this story is Arabic, is Libyan Arabic, and more specifically is Badia Arabic, so a dialect of Arabic in Eastern Libya. And you also underline how concepts uh, long, with a long use in Eurocentric languages, such as the concept of Bedouins to uh, address Libyans, yeah. should not be used anymore. And how, and also how much violence is buried in the name of the country. Libya as a name is a colonial invention, but we yeah. still use it. And we have naturalized it as a normal way to address a region. But uh, I want to like show the last slide because I really like the, the chapters uh, in which you discuss, oh no, wait, the, um, the words of the survival. So I will share the screen the last for the last time. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. So this is okay. I want to report two quotes from your um, from your book again, and the first one is from survivor Mufta Al Shilmani. Our life is one of Shar, Qua, Kadar, Bamarad, and the second quote is by uh, Abdal Ali. Al Fakri, people died because of Kadar, Shar, and Marad. So sadness, evil, hunger, depression, illness. Those are words to which you, I mean, to you paid a lot of attention to create a new vocabulary. How is which, which vocabulary is uh, the right one to tell the story of, I mean, the, the story, this, this hidden story, this forgotten story. So can, and also the term of shark is very important and you used it in the title. So can you elaborate more about why you decided to keep those words in their original language and why shark is so important and you want shark to be a, a symbol of the Libyan genocide? Um, that's a, a good question, Roberta. The, I, in general, after spending almost uh, 20 years studying um, North African colonial history, the area that I studied in depth for uh, since I was a uh, graduate student, 
I decided to pay attention to how language is specific to time and place. And, and language is not a matter of um, uh, above history or above, above um, a historical context. Not only from one country to another, but also within a country itself. So methodologically, I wanted to, to understand not only what they said, how they said it, and what does it mean in that specific moment prior to uh, the internment, during the internment, and after that. That really uh, threw me off because this, you're absolutely right, the dialect Al-Badia or Badia at Barqa and, cent and, and, and Central Libya is really specific. And this is not unusual. In Italy, you have different dialects and different, you know, um, 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 Italians as well. So, but then I discovered I really didn't understand it. It took two years for me to understand the vocabulary, the language, the uh, expressions, the metaphors, the syntax of, of, of the of the language and how to express. And often when um, you know, um, I relied on my aunt and my, I remember stories that my mother and my grandmother used to say, and both didn't, um, were illiterate, didn't go to, uh, to school because of the colonial situation. So I spent quite a long, long time trying to understand how culturally and linguistically the community itself that was interned you know, express itself. And I made a choice that I wanted to, for example, some people I interviewed two or three times to see whether the story is changed or not, just to make sure that I'm not just taking the story itself. And I wanted to write after I figure out and became equipped to understand the, the poems, the vocabulary, the expressions, uh, and, and through, through long, long time of talking with them and interacting with them, I became fluent and equipped to investigate it. And I decided to, um, to, um, to uh, let them speak for themselves. And the title of the book, if it, it, was, it wasn't my choice to call it this, I wanted to make it the subtitle. And I wanted people worldwide who might be interested in this topic of the Libyan struggles, you know, and, and, and victims of, of genocide to be able to have the title that really reflect that experience. So Arabic language, shar in Arabic, classical Arabic means evil. But in the camps and how the survivors and the interned people use it, it meant specifically Star death by starvation, disease, trauma, and also depression. It's a calamity, a, a condemnation of the whole idea of fascist colonization. And when uh, people say, sure, oh, everybody understand it. Everybody understand it in that sense. So I insisted in making that a subtitle of my book, and I want people who are interested in this really hidden history of the Libyan people who were uh, uh, interned in these terrible concentration camps to remember that as they remember Shoah um, about the Holocaust or so. So Shar will become the symbol and, and the metaphor for the concentration camps and what the native uh, survivors uh, viewed it and it become really a way of honoring them and instead of giving it a, a very fancy or very elegant academic title on my own. Yeah, because after the colonial experience, neither the language remained the same. So new meanings were attached to exactly. language that were used regularly. I mean, Shar, you say in the book that it was a word from the Quran and then it was completely remaining. I mean, it, 
it went through a process of resignification during the colonial period. So yeah, yes. it was very interesting. And I have a comment in the chat. So, uh, well, you discussed this in the book, what happened after, so the psychological implication of the concentration camps. So uh, in, the, in the following generation, how, how does this affect the following generation? So I don't know, honey, if I uh, interpret very well your, uh, your comment, but we will open the floor in a minute. But yeah, if you can just say how the, the, concentration, the experience and the memories of the concentration camp affected the following generation in Libya. Yes, as the, as the national, this is a very good question. As an, the, 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 the independent state decided, as I said earlier, well, we came out of horrors, starvation, exile, deportations, trauma, and now we have a chance to build our own state. Why don't you focus on the positive? And it looks like even society accepted that we need to heal. So that very horrible phase of colonial history was almost kind of became relegate, um, relegated to family history a little bit mentioned here about the, the great um, uh, resistance that she had and other things. But it's very interesting. This is, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Hani's question is very, very good one. The, when I went to interview uh, the survivors, often I will be surrounded by their children and grandchildren. And something very remarkable I noticed over the time because as I said, and I, I had over 300 interviews and I asked my own questions and I had other people who interview, gave me their own interviews. I went into details about um, what they uh, eat, what they dress, what they, uh, uh, all of the details that anthropologists used to ask and, and my other colleagues used to make fun of me. They say, they say, this is really very, very American, very anthropological. I said, they are relevant questions in many ways. So, what I noticed is the following. The children and grandchildren memorize the stories and they correct their grandmother or grandfather about something happened and you told them and, and as if this has become a family communal history outside the state. And I think uh, what I um, uh, noticed after that is that um, many of, of the grandchildren and the children continue to remember these stories and memorize the poems that, was, that were composed inside the camps. And uh, they memorize them. And I have to say also, many of them began to contact me. So they knew the history as um, it had been narrated by them. And when I did a survey, I came at the end, which is related to this question. I said, I don't wanna just study the, the period that, you know, of the internment and the genocide between 29 and um, uh, 34. I said, I wanna see how the youth viewed this. So I made a survey uh, and I asked, uh, college students in seven Libyan universities in Eastern Libya, in Central Libya, in Western Libya, and Southern Libya. And the, the finding, and I, I want to also say this, by the way, despite my expertise in this uh, in the, and scholarship on the subject, most of the material that I discovered, 70%, I would say, is brand new, brand new to me. In Eastern Libya, most of the people, most of the youth, the college students, men and women, they refer to their family oral history as the key for educating them about what happened in the camps. In Western Libya, the story was very hazy. Very, very, they, didn't, they remember Lion of the Desert, the movie, uh, Mustafa Akkad's 1981 film. They didn't really remember much of it. And, and they got mad because they say, they, they don't tell us, they didn't tell us about it. In Southern Libya, it's very different. And in, in, in Central Libya, because it's related to Eastern uh, Libya, they knew about it. But in Southern Libya, we found, a, I found a very interesting answer among the youth. Teachers, yes, families, 
who fought until 1930 uh, know about it. But teachers in the schools of independent Libya in their own way in the state of Fazan played a crucial role in educating and highlighting the youth about what happened. But for me, I'll, I'll, I'll end this answer, uh, this question by answering this. The first time I remembered about it because of my father told me about it. And I remember my late mother, when somebody say, I'm ill and say, say oh, ma be marad, Roberta. She goes to that epic poem that hunted silence and you know, re reminded Libyans, most Libyans remember that poem, epic poem uh, by this brilliant, uh, gentle um, uh, poet, Rajab Buhwesh al-Nifi, who uh, uh, composed that poem. And really that poem to me is really um, made that the counter history alive. So I think society, in terms of societal um, a reaction in Eastern Libya, in Central Libya and, and Southern Libya, it's alive. In Western Libya, because of geography and because of distance and because of censorship, the story of the, of, of the concentration camps was less known. So memory, in other words, uh, became alive in terms of um, uh, um, uh, um, Libyan history, but it's really, even with, within Libya, it, it varied from one region to another. Okay, I have three questions ready for you. So I will open the floor. Yeah. And yes, so the first is Matteo. I will unmute him. So he will pose the question uh, himself. Matteo, if you can, uh, yeah, go ahead. Dr. Amida, thank you. Thank you so much, I mean, uh, for, um, for relaying us this um, this personal story in a way, and it's not just a story of, of what happened, you know, with the, but it's also your your own story. And uh, yes, I mean, I, I agree with you that certainly needs, uh, there needs to be a debate. We hope that your book will be translated in Italian as well. I hope so. I hope so. Really, you know, we are we are working, and we are we. Are, I mean, we, that's why we wanted you here today. So. Yes. You know, this is, uh, it is really important for us to come to terms with the past and with what we have done. And I would argue personally what we continue to do. But in any case, uh, my question would be for you is there, one, it would be, uh, it's related to, to this center that you discovered in Fezan that you said it was uh, in the city of Hon, in, uh, it was opened in 1992. And you said you found this gem of, uh, in terms of archives and stories. And I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that. And then the, the last question I wanted to ask you, which is related still to the state of the archives. Are, is, there be, is, is, is there currently an effort to preserve archives now in the country? I mean, what is your, uh, your own understanding? What is happening? Is there, I know it is, Libya is in a difficult situation that needs to reconcile with a very tumultuous past, but uh, are resources being uh, saved or there is, you know, how do you see what is happening? And thank you so much again for this. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matteo. And I would love uh, to see the book um, translated into Italian. You guys, you will have my blessing because the, the purpose of this book is not to score points, is to open debates and bring people together. That's my purpose. And uh, we are all in this together in many ways. So I would love that very much. Your question right in the money about the town of Hoon, because I discovered that ordinary uh, communities, ordinary people are very creative, more than the state. And here is uh, what happened with the people of Hoon. Uh, now, it happened that I was born just in, in, in a town next to it called Waddan. And people know each other very well. It's just half an hour um, uh, south of Waddan. What the people of Hoon did is very interesting. In their own initiative, they collected a, a very much a prelude to the uh, um, deportation and the internment of the whole civilian population, rural population of Eastern Libya. What happened is after the Battle of Afia, and by the way, both of my grandparents were in, in that battle and uh, in, in the, in the anti-colonial resistance. So I know it well. Uh, I know it as a child and I know it as, as, as um, a grown up as well. The Italian army 
went to the town of Hun, the center of, of, of the military administration, colonial administration, and they punished the people of Hun because they, they supplied and they helped uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the resistance uh, that uh, hit and run, uh, I'm talking about uh, the door of Abdul Jalil and Ahmed Saif al-Nasr. What they did, they executed, they hanged 18 uh, sheikhs and including uh, two children in public. And that led to, uh, that's also um, related to what Roberta said earlier, to a, a, a 18 years old young woman uh, poets. Her name is Fatima Uthman, wrote incredible poem. Uh, my, my homeland was ruined twice. She wrote only one poem at that, at that sense. And, um, and then the, uh, they decided the fascist colonial uh, military administration decided to make, to punish the people of Hun and make them a case to, to um, uh, um, um, deter and listen the lesson to the rest of the uh, resisting population in the interior. So they deported them on foot from the town of Hun to Buerat um, Lihsun uh, near Sirt to Khums and Masrata. And they put them there in, in confinement uh, for, um, for um, uh, three years. This story I thought was really the rehearsal in colonial history to what happened later on. The internment and the deportation that happened there. And then I discovered that it's not just a new phase by Graziani, Badoglio, and Dolbono and the fascist generals who really said, we're gonna do that at any price. We have to crush the resistance, even if you wipe the whole native population. And that's a, a letter that I found um, in, the, in the archives. The, the people of Hun in the, uh, in the late 70s did something remarkable, Matteo. They decided to collect their own oral history uh, record it, uh, document it, uh, preserve it, and every year they commemorate it and they go to schools and teach the kids about what happened to the town. And uh, so it's almost like a voluntary subaltern way of recording history. And they were gracious because they know me and my family and many of them were my friends in the Boy Scouts or in schools or, um, or we grow up in Sabha together, they gave me a gift. They said, this is what we did. This is the oral history that we, we made, uh, we collected. And also they wrote a, a letter asking for compensation for the horrors that happened to their, their grandparents and grandmothers. So that educated me that when people voluntarily do these things, is probably more effective than a state having a museum for its own glory or its own use. I still would like to have the 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 uh, camps being um, um, uh, repaired and maybe a, a museum to collect all the artifacts. So people, you know, Libyans, Italians, others who are interested, one day will go there to uh, visit and learn about it. Uh, the second uh, question, uh, Matteo. Thanks to Dr. Jarrari, Muhammad Jarrari, this remarkable man gave Gaddafi all the propaganda that he needs on the side, but he built a first rate center in Libya. Unfortunately, after 2011 uprising, Libya is, is, is you know, engulfed in a civil war and people began to, to, to fight each other and, uh, you know, have allies outside. Uh, a month ago, that center became under threat because Salafis and jihadists wanted to take over uh, the center, which has a treasure of oral history that never, never collected before. And uh, archives in Italian, in French, in German, in, in, uh, in Ottoman, uh, uh, Turkish, and of course, above all, Arabic uh, treasure of oral history. That Dr. Jarari 
has been open to all kinds of scholars and researchers who uh, have to uh, work there. Unfortunately, they almost took it over. I participated and I mobilized people in support of this. And that was successful campaign. For now, we preserved the center. But unfortunately, it's not over until Libya recovered and the Libyan people um, salvaged their, their own um, uh, right from all of these uh, factions, warlords, and um, mercenary groups that are pillaging the country and also wanted to destroy all of the things that were built by Libyan people from the colonial period, independence, and uh, under September period. So um, it, it's going to be a challenge. But I think, uh, inshallah, God willing, we will be, all will be able to preserve uh, and move on. Uh, but it's a, Libya now in a sad situation, as you both know.